Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jazz Russell. I'm a researcher at Ravensbourne University in London and um, I'm going to be talking to you and going through with you um, some material on AR markers. The focus of this particular presentation is about looking at um, things that can be used for augmented reality experiences. They're usually at the very beginning. You need something that's going to trigger an augmented reality experience. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is looking at how these kinds of triggers or targets can be selected and how they can be produced and lastly how they can be implemented. Just as a brief summary of what I'm going to be talking about, it's the core subject for today. Um, what actually is an augmented reality target or trigger? Well, most of you, if you haven't already had an experience of it, you're going to find that it's going to be something that's typically um, a 2D uh, kind of uh, sketch or photograph or image. It can be a sketch. Someone can just draw something on a piece of paper, and that could potentially be uh, something that triggers an AR experience through a smart device. It can be a 3D physical object. Um, in the real world, uh, it could be projected on a, a screen perhaps, um, or it could be something that's even on a mobile phone display. The display though, it could be on a smartphone, it could be on a tablet, and um, it's something that typically is also something that could be uh, captured through a mixed reality headset or a computer webcam. So all of those things could be the input mechanism to look at the target and then generate uh, an augmented reality experience from it. So that's essentially what it is. Um, I'm going to just go through some examples in a minute of that, but I want to mention where augmented reality triggers and targets lie in the grand spectrum of things. It's already been mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about the mixed reality spectrum. At Ravensbourne, we're a creative arts institution, and a few years ago, um, the head of fashion came to me and said, I'd like to do an augmented reality experience and um, it was to do with fashion that was for the European Space Agency. Now, they'd got physical clothes. They'd also produced 3D scans of these clothes and 3D prints of these clothes too. In all, we were working about four or five different kinds of reality. And then later, um, the architecture department approached me and they said, actually, we want to mention these realities as part of the creative process. But they want to include the reality of a person's imagination as well in the creative workflow, if you like. And these are all things that exist at the beginning of that spectrum you would have seen earlier in to do with the real world and the everyday world. So these precede uh, augmented reality and reality as well as the mixed reality spectrum. You, you actually need to begin here before you go over to that side of the spectrum. So most augmented reality targets, the sources of them, you're going to find in those uh, realities that are highlighted there. That you'll find them in the world, in everyday reality, in physical reality. They could be a sketch or they could be a captured reality in the form of a photograph, for example, or a 3D scan, um, or even a video. They could be something that's generated inside of a computer, like a computer-aided drawing or um, some kind of CAD model, for example. Um, and lastly, they could also be something that's physically been printed from a computer. So that's a bit distinct from everyday physical reality because that 3D printed reality is kind of generated from the preceding reality within a computer. So those realities are typically where you're going to find um, the, the targets that are going to be the source of augmented reality experiences. This is my first experiment many years ago. And uh, you don't need to hear the sound or anything, but... This is the, what I mentioned earlier about the fashion experiment where we try to explore how to create things in four different realities, ultimately ending up in augmented reality experience. Now in this particular case, I'm just using the webcam of my computer to point to a target on my phone and um, the experience, which is within Unity, is leading to a scan that was done of a person wearing European Space Agency fashion that people might potentially wear in space many years from now and um, got it to be projected uh, onto the phone. And you can see it's quite stable as I'm moving it around. And I, was doing, I did this about three years ago when I first started uh, experimenting on using augmented reality within the university and specific departments. Um, there are some, this, and this one you're seeing it actually on top of a display. And one of the things that you'll hear about later is how important it is to have a target actually be quite a fixed, rigid, solid thing 
preferably not something that bends or is, or is flexible. Um, here I've produced the same target on a piece of paper and um, I'm just resting it on a chair and what you'll see in a moment is um, as I move around the piece of paper the, the actual target uh, model that's on top it, it tends to be a bit jumpy and it's because the paper is distorting and bending and it's being more difficult to track exactly uh, how it's laid out and how it should overlay a model on top so it's a bit more jittery so one of the characteristics that you're going to find for good AR targets is for them not to be too, too um, uh, flexible or distorted. If that happens, then you get poor recognition of the target and the object that you're putting on top tends not to be very stable in terms of how you move with it in conjunction with your hands or other movement mechanisms that might be applied. I just wanted to show those two because for me, I want you to know where I began my journey. It wasn't terribly complicated, it was just literally taking a scan and using Unity to um, display a model. Uh, in this case, as I said, just through my phone and um, through a piece of paper. So one of the things that you realize from that is the targets don't necessarily need to be physical pieces of paper or card, which is a lot, a lot of people think targets actually are. Um, but you can literally just bring up an image on your phone and providing there's a camera to look at it and register it, it can project an AR experience on top. And a lot of the time when I just haven't got uh, a printer available, <laughs> that's what I do. I just put it on my phone and, or on a tablet and it, it'll hopefully register it. And um, if the light's good and there's not too many reflections, it tends to pick it up and display it. And it's pretty good in that respect and it's a very portable solution. And good for the environment too because you're not using tons and tons of paper to do that. Okay. An overview of what I'm going to be looking at today are um, three phases, if you like, for uh, looking at creating um, an augmented reality target and implementing it. To begin with, I'm going to look at what is it that um, makes an ideal target. How do you actually go about selecting a target for an augmented reality experience? How do you design one? Secondly, I'll look at how, once you've made a choice about what kind of target you want and uh, what kind of design, how you actually go and physically produce it, but also how you optimize it. If it's a physical image, it might need to be compressed. You might need to do some optimization with it. If it's a 3D model, uh, you might want to reduce the polygons or faces on it to make it a bit more simpler and easier to process. And lastly, once you've actually got your target all made up, you need to actually make it usable and something that can be implemented in the real world. So it might need to be printed, for example, on a piece of paper, um, usually, if the targets are going to be small, it's okay to print it on a piece of paper that you normally find uh, in copiers and printers, uh, A4 paper or something like that. The, the weight of that paper is probably sufficient for small augmented reality targets. But um, if you want something bigger, then you probably should put the image that you've printed on top of a bit of stiff card. Um, it's maybe something that's got uh, foam back to it so it's easy to move around and easy uh, to adjust in terms of orientation and angle. So when you physically produce AI uh, targets, there's a whole kind of science to that because, uh, for example, you don't want your uh, finished product to have too much glossiness or shininess to it because when light reflects of it, as far as the camera is concerned, those reflections, those flares, they're part of the image and it might lead to the target not being recognized. So the materials that you use uh, are going to be quite important and various physical properties of the materials you use to put your target on are going to need to be considered. So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later, but that's the, an overview of the process. Uh, begin, to begin by selecting and designing, then go and produce and optimize and finally make sure that you use the right kind of materials at the end uh, to actually utilize that particular target that you've created. You may end up, like I said, just having the um, target on, on a display like on your phone, in which case you don't need to worry about materials. But even then, you're going to get possibly some reflection. And I found that as far as the camera is concerned, if you do use your phone, it's good to turn the brightness down on that um, because the camera is not going to be overwhelmed with the level of light and brightness there is, it'll be easier for it to uh, see the contrasting features on the display uh, that relate to the actual augmented reality target. So, as I said, even when you're just using a phone, not using physical materials, there's still things to consider.
the workflow that I'm going to mention to you that relates to um, those three stages, but also all the realities I mentioned earlier, was fully tested uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, this year, if you don't know, it's the 500th anniversary of Leonardo da Vinci's death. And um, uh, 500 years ago, he created some designs for perpetual motion machines. He never built them. Uh, they were just uh, things of his imagination, Gedanken experiments, if you like. Um, is that, did I pronounce that correctly? I think I did. Thought experiments. And um, he, he, just try, he just wanted to see from his imagination what kind of things would need to be built in order for a machine to be constantly running. And um, in his case, he had uh, balls that would sit on a particular device, and the weight of the ball would drive it around. And providing additional balls were included, the machine should keep on going. But even he, in the end, realized that it wasn't really going to work <laughs> because um, there were all sorts of things to consider, like friction and uh, loss of energy through heat and a bunch of other things. But the reason why I'm mentioning it is because it was a real challenge to do this particular exhibition that's currently on at the Peltz Gallery in the School of Arts in Birkbeck College in central London. Uh, so you can Google Peltz Gallery and you'll see that it's on until the 12th of March and you can go and see it. Um, all the realities are represented here. You've got the imagination of Leonardo originally. Um, we've got everyday reality being represented by, we've got facsimiles of the original sketches he had and the books that borrowed from the v &A. Um, we've got computer-generated designs. We've got um, captured uh, images of those sketches and that were turned into animations and video as well. Computer-generated images that were turned into uh, physical models uh, that were 3D printed. And lastly, um, the models were taken into Unity uh, to create an augmented reality experience that was saved as an Android app. And it was also saved as a PC app. And it was also saved as a HoloLens app. So basically, we did a workflow across all those realities. And it, it's a challenge. I thought I was just going to take a model and stick it into Unity and then show it up on HoloLens. But the actual art of producing all these different media uh, across those realities is a whole new kind of directing challenge. Um, editors, when they work on films, they usually cut between scenes. And there's a whole art to editing uh, as far as films are concerned. But what we're beginning to find is that more and more people who are working in the creative arts, they're actually doing um, transitioning, if you like, between one reality and another. <laughs> so they might work from their imagination, put something on a sketch, turn it into a model, and then see it in, uh, as a 3D print or augmented reality or ultimately a mixed reality. So they're typically making that journey with every creative act that they do, especially with these technologies now being available. So it's important to consider that context. If you are going to make a marker, you think it's not just something that's going to lead to a model appearing. You could be creating a whole story, and it could be going across all those realities in, the, in terms of the production process, and that's something to worth, worth considering. So um, I'll begin just talking about selection and design. As I, as I go along, I'll ask you to take part in some experiments. And um, I'll mention those as we get to them. The most important things to look at when it comes to a 2D augmented reality target um, is specifically to look at two factors. One, that the target is something that the application can recognize through a camera. It needs to be able to identify it. Secondly, it needs to be able to keep... Um, in concept with it when the target's being moved. And if there's an object being placed on top, it needs to be able to be synchronized with that particular movement. So it has to be trackable. And just because something's easily recognizable, it doesn't mean it's easily trackable. So for example, um, in a moment, I'll show you some uh, pictures which uh, are AR targets which are very easily recognizable. They consist of lots of regular um, uh, shapes and patterns. However, if you shift the pattern just a little bit, it looks more or less the same as it did just before. So as far as the camera is concerned, it doesn't know that it's moved. So even though it's very recognizable and it's got lots of recognizable features, unfortunately it's not suitable for uh, tracking when the target's being moved. Hmm? Yeah, like circles or uh, rows of circles or rows of squares, things like that, where there's very little uh, difference between... Uh, one position and a uh, position when it's been translated a little bit, yeah, or rotated, or those kind of things. I'll mention those a little bit more in a moment. But if you're going to create really good targets, 
the, the, the two most important things are <laughs> it's got to be recognizable and it's got to be trackable. Secondly, the augmented reality uh, target that you're going to use is going to have to be a specific size for the kind of experience that you're trying to generate. If it's something you want to be portable and you want to share it between people, then it's no good being six foot high and three foot wide. It needs to be um, something that fits in your hand. So size is directly related to the kind of experience you want to actually create. These are all factors you have to consider way before you actually deliver the experience. Secondly, you want to look at how far do you want to be from the target um, and be able to see the actual experience. Do you, is it something that's a close-up thing? Or is it something that you want to be able to create an experience from even when someone's, say, six or seven foot away? In the case of environmental uh, AR, where you have buildings and you want your device to be triggered by a building, a 3D um, environmental uh, scene, then you might be uh, tens of meters away, hundreds of feet away. So you need to take into consideration this um, relationship between size and distance. It's particularly important because each of the augmented reality um, tools that are out there and software, they each have their own limits in terms of detection and tracking when it comes to the size of the AR target relative to the distance that the software is trying to detect it at. I'll, I'll mention um, some of those uh, in a moment. So if it can be recognized and it can be tracked and it's the right kind of size for the distance that you're looking at it, then the next thing to look at is are there enough recognizable features on it for it to be identified? And secondly, for it to be able to um, adjust things when things are changed in terms of their orientation. So it's, it could have lots of features, as I said earlier. It could be very easily recognizable, but they have to be the right features. Okay, so um, there needs to be a distribution to them such that they are, one, recognizable, and secondly, they're trackable. Um, so distribution is really important. If all the most recognizable features that are going to be used for tracking it and identifying it are in the bottom left corner of the image, and the rest of the image has got nothing useful that's going to contribute, then it would probably be better to uh, crop down to that particular part of the image and just use that as the thing that you want to have as the AR target. If you do want to use the whole image, then you're going to have to create some additional um, designs around the rest of it so that it becomes something that's um, going to be able to be tracked. Okay? If you've got loads of white space, for example, you might want to put a border around that and have a, a random pattern, for example, with triangles and things like that. And that way you can include the rest of the image. The, the Leonardo um, exhibition is an example where we had uh, images, which you'll see in a moment, where there was a lot of symmetry and there was a lot of white space. And the target was very difficult to identify when it was being looked at at that part because there weren't that many identifiable features. So we began to play and do all sorts of things. And some of the things that we did to help it make it more identifiable, I'll mention in a moment. It's important that the AR marker or AR target presents unique views uh, when you're looking at different orientations. So, for example, if you're looking at the right way up, it should look very different to how it is when it's turned 90 degrees, and when it, even when it's turned 180 degrees. Okay? So there mustn't be any um, horizontal or vertical symmetry. Um, and also, rotationally, there shouldn't be any symmetry either. So if you rotate it 45 degrees, it shouldn't look the same as it does when it's been rotated 45 degrees the other way. Okay? So these are factors that are particularly important. And you'll see some examples of them in a moment. The, the thing that I did mention just now is that in some situations, the actual target that you want to use uh, for the sake of uh, aesthetically linking with the experience might not actually be a good target in itself. So we were using some of Leonardo's sketches, and it turned out that they didn't have that many identifiable features that could be used for recognition and for tracking. So we, we did all sorts of things to try and make it more augmentable. And um, one of the things that we did was put additional markers around the corner of the designs and the images in order for it to become more recognizable and trackable. Turns out that didn't work very, very, very well. <laughs> but in the numerous experiments we tried, we became <laughs> quite expert at finding ways to make something that's essentially not augmentable um, to make it easier to be recognized and trackable by 
changing the features of the actual image itself by changing things like exposure, uh, contrast, um, some of the, the gamma feature of the image, which looks at you know, the saturation and a number of other things to do with the colors and the uh, shading within the image. Um, this is a, a table looking at the various augmented reality toolkits that are out there and their particular um, properties when it comes to this uh, factor of size and distance. And what you'll notice is that some work quite well only at close distances and at longer distances they're not so good. And some work better when you look at them uh, sideways and others don't. So there's a number of different properties that make one toolkit better than another. Um, obviously some of these are free and some of these you have to pay subscriptions for to get the more uh, sophisticated aspects of uh, their features. But this particular rating that you see at the bottom was given by the person who uh, runs the Think Mobile site and you can see it includes a lot of factors to take into account uh, when it comes to choosing a particular augmented reality toolkit. Um, I personally have been using Viforia um, but I've also used some of the others and uh, I've set up with Vivoria for now because, one, most of the work that I do can be done for free. I can do a lot of stuff online. I can share it with people. And it gives me uh, things that I can easily uh, integrate into things like Unity, for example. And more recently, they've introduced things uh, which allow 3D images or 3D models, like CAD models, for example, or scans, uh, to be brought into the recognition process. So um, that's a good reference uh, for checking which toolkit you might want to use depending on size and distance requirements for the experience that you're trying to create as well as the angles within which you've got to be able to look at the image and still have the augmented reality experience generated. For the Leonardo exhibition, we actually created um, a floor uh, illustration which showed zones within which the person could move and outside of those zones we knew the uh, experience was going to get broken because the angle of incidence that were person was looking at their target was too narrow for the software to be able to de detect things ac um, accurately and uh, effectively. So sometimes you have to think not just in terms of the target, you have to think of the experience and you might need to guide people, especially if it's a, a fixed experience, to ensure that they get the best experience and they don't go outside of the ranges that the software can actually handle. Okay. So take that into consideration when you think about the implementation phase, which I'll, I'll mention later. It's, like I said, this is something we had to do at the implementation stage, but we didn't know about at the beginning. Only when we turned up in the gallery and we had to put stuff there, we realized all sorts of problems. For example, when someone was looking at a target through the HoloLens, you could have other people who were looking at the target through a tablet wander right in front of them <laughs> and break the experience because uh, they'd uh, interrupted the... Uh, direct path between the person who's looking at things and the, the target itself. That's where things like um, extended tracking become useful, where if the line of sight to the target is broken, then if there's a model or something else, it can be sustained in its position until uh, the target is recovered in terms of the camera. So in Unity, and especially for the HoloLens, that's really important. You want to be able to provide uh, a continuous experience. And that can also work with uh, tablets as well as phones. We found that when we included extended tracking, uh, it meant that when the person happened to wander off or change their orientation, um, they could come back and they could continue to see the experience. So they didn't have to wait for the image to be triggered again in order for them to continue to enjoy the actual experience. The, the features that Vuforia particularly outline, I'll mention um, best practices from different uh, producers of toolkits, but um, I mentioned before here, and you can see there's only maybe four or five key things that you ought to really remember. One, it's got to be rich in detail. Uh, two, uh, it's got to have uh, good contrast between the foreground and the background. Um, it's important that there aren't repetitive patterns because that can influence tracking. And um, lastly, it's a good idea that if there's lots of edges and crossing lines because they act as uh, good reference points or augmentable points that can be used for tracking and for identification. The format is important because if the um, image or target you're using has got a lot of richness to it, it's going to add to processing time. 
It's going to add to time before the target's recognized. It's going to add to delays and latency when it comes to the um, image being tracked. So you have to ask yourself, do you really need a 32-bit you know, JPEG image to be your target or 24-bit PNG or whatever? Maybe it's okay just to have an 8-bit uh, image, um, something that's only got 256 colors or 256 shades of gray, for example. Maybe it'd be better if it was just mono, black and white. You know? um, so think about exactly what quality of experience you can um, engage with and still get the effect that you were looking for. You don't necessarily have to uh, use something that's high fidelity. Sometimes you just want to uh, generate the experience and you're not really concerned about the image that's going to be used to just begin it for a fraction of a second. That's something that you need to consider. In the Leonardo um, exhibition, we had this as a big challenge. <laughs> um, I put markers around the outside, which increased the stability and the recognition and tracking of the image. But at the last moment, it was felt these big black fiduciary markers around the edge of Leonardo's work was a bit of an invasion. And um, we had to take them off uh, because it just kind of ruined the experience. So uh, in that instance, even though it was only going to be encountered for a fraction of a second, um, it was felt that they were prepared for things to be uh, worked with in a more complicated way, just so they can maintain the quality and the spirit of the experience. It's never just a technical thing. It's, it's going to involve artistic decisions as well, and aesthetic decisions, and cultural decisions as well. So there's a lot of factors to consider when it comes to choosing a target and exactly uh, how you're going to go about creating it. All right, so looking at some of the things that make good AR targets, um, how likely do you think that this would be a good AR target? It's not trackable because if you turned it or moved it, it the, the software typically wouldn't know that that's what's happened because it just looks the same as it did before. Yeah? And the cardinal rule with these things usually is you don't want symmetry. Ideally, you want... Um, uh, no symmetry horizontally, vertically, or uh, when it's actually rotated. Okay. Um, it can also be, bear in mind, it can also be rotated in the third dimension, and it might look the same, you know, in that direction as well. So this is why it's important to, as a rule, make sure that your target has no symmetry. All right. How about this? This one's got four identifiable points that could potentially be used to track this object. But what would happen if this was rotated? So if, what would happen if it was 45 degrees rotated? Would it be the same as what we're looking at? No, it wouldn't. So it looks like it might be a good candidate. But what happened if I rotate it another 45 degrees? It goes back to looking the way it does. So at first, it looks like it might be a good candidate. But then it turns out it's not when you consider further uh, sort of shifts in orientation. So just having it shifted 45 degrees, it looks on the surface to be different. And maybe the tracking or the recognition should function a bit better. But as I said, you turn it a bit more and you're back to where you started. Here's another candidate. What do you think, on a scale of, say, 0 to 10, how good a target is this? Six. Six. Why, why isn't it a 7 or an 8? It's still got symmetry, yeah. So here it doesn't look like it's got symmetry, but you rotate it 45 degrees or 90 degrees, and you can see the left side and the right side look the same, even though, in this case, it's vertical symmetry from uh, left side and right side, but there isn't um, horizontal symmetry. The, the bottom part doesn't look like the top part, okay? And rotationally, it is different. So this is a slightly better candidate, but again, um, if it was just rotated by a certain degrees, number of degrees, um, the software wouldn't know uh, what the actual orientation of this target actually is. All right, I'm going, going through a combination. Try something which is completely not augmentable, like a circle, and combine it with what we had. And on a scale of, again, uh, 0 to 10, how, what kind of score would you give this? An 8? Yeah. Yeah, it's, if you look, it doesn't have horizontal or vertical symmetry, and rotationally speaking, um, it's, if you look at these two, these are a bit close. 
uh, even though they're rotated on different sides of the actual vertical line. Um, so it's getting there, but it's still got issues. There's still going to be points where of orientation where there might be some confusion and a lack of clarity exactly what the orientation actually is. Um, as I said, some of the targets, if they're really good, they, could have, they will have high contrast between the foreground and the background. And um, if they're mono and they're black and white, they tend to be very easy to recognize. And a lot of these kinds of markers, what's known as fiduciary uh, targets or markers, they're, they're used often in um, environments where the targets are actually placed on walls or they're placed on an object. And that way, the computer vision is usually familiar with these kinds of targets. It's already trained through machine learning and other things to recognize these kinds of targets. And that they're really easy to work with. The problem with them is that um, they, they're not very good to work with close up. They, they're meant to be worked with at a distance. Um, they have low pattern detail, so they don't have very many identifiable uh, features as such. So they're very, they can be very quick to recognize, but maybe not so uh, good when it comes to tracking. Um, but the high foreground background contrast makes it very good to recognize. And often these kinds of patterns, especially when they're used in combination, can be quite good for uh, identifying the different parts of something that's being augmented. It's also lower in terms of processing demand because there's not that many features to process. Okay, So there are a number of uh, good reasons why these are sometimes used. And, and you'll see in a moment, we used some of these little Leonardo exhibition when the main image itself wasn't good enough and we wanted to spruce up its augmentability a bit. Um, I should mention here, though, that barcodes often are thought to fall into this family, but they, they're not. One reason, because they're one-dimensional. They tend to follow a line. And the two-dimensional versions of those, which are typically QR codes, um, they tend to have a high number of dots inside of them. And as a consequence of that, you tend to need to be pretty close to them to be able to recognize them. They're not really good for long distance kind of augmented reality. So there's a reason why those are not used in the way that these particular kinds of targets are. So here's an example of what we tried to do with a Leonardo um, a target. And as it turns out, you can probably see the top half, there's a lot of white space. And the central target, it looks like um, it would be a good target because it's got um, a lot of anti-symmetry in it. But actually, in terms of rotation, <laughs> it, it could cause problems. And we found that was an issue. All of his writing is in mirror writing. As you can see, that's how he used to write. Um, and that actually proved to be uh, something that provided a lot of uniquely identifiable, augmentable features and were useful in both uh, recognition and also tracking. But... Um, for some reason, the HoloLens um, and Vifuria just seemed to find it difficult to um, track it, and we didn't know why. So we tried an experiment, and we tried to put some of these markers around the outside, and it became immensely stable. And it was rock solid in terms of its stability and its ability to be tracked as well. So we took something that was potentially um, uh, had a, maybe a three-star out of five-star rating, as far as before it was concerned, as in terms of its augmentability. And then when we added these markers, it jumped right up to five stars. Uh, unfortunately, the curator didn't like these big black things on the edge of Leonardo's work, so we had to take them off, even though we'd solved the problem of stability. So we, we ended up doing other things to um, get the stability back. But that's the great thing with the experimentation. Um, we found new ways to get things done. All right. Um, Next thing I want to look at is how you go about actually producing um, and getting ready for implementation uh, with these particular kinds of targets, specifically looking at optimization. All right. Um, sometimes you take a picture of something and it doesn't have a, a regular kind of outline to it. It doesn't, isn't rectangular or triangular or something like that. It can be a curved uh, kind of target, something like this. In that case, what you need to do is you need to provide that clear boundary to it. And usually that means just putting a rectangle around it. Okay? So you can put the image into Word or Photoshop and just uh, sketch out a, tri a, a rectangle around it. Um, then having that clear boundary, 
it's easier for the software to identify exactly which areas it should be attempting to identify features within. All right? If there are no boundaries, it doesn't know where it should be looking for features and where it shouldn't. All right. <laughs> In this particular model, uh, a 3D model um, that we're potentially going to be using after it's going to be 3D printed, um, it, uh, it has very few features. Anybody know why? Yeah, the colors are the colors are important and they are plain, but actually believe it or not, that's a good thing. All right, it's graduations and shades that you tend to have to worry about. But what do you notice about the edges and where edges meet one another? It's the problem here is smooth. It's too much, too many soft features, and you'll find this in another diagram I'll show you in a moment. Um, it needs to have some sharp edges, really. Uh, or it needs the soft edges to cross each other. Like when two circles cross each other and make a vesica Pisces, the X, the X points which uh, the two crosses, the two circles cross over on, they are identifiable, useful points, even though you've got two circles. Okay. So having edges cross each other is a good thing to actually have. Can people just raise their hand and give me an example of how two lines might cross? What kind of shape? What kind of... Uh, well, how would it look when two lines cross or connect? Can you give an example? Yeah, first of all is X. That's an example. All right, how else could do you typically see two lines? Yeah, it will be like a, a Y, a bit like this, or something like that. Actually, if you look at a T shape like this, that's a variation of a Y. Okay, it's just that the uh, two bits are flattened. Topologically speaking, in terms of shape, that's exactly the same as a Y. All right, okay, anything else? You have this as well, L, or V shape as well. Okay, so these anywhere where you see these kinds of crossings, all right, they are potentially useful, recognizable, uh, augmentable points. All right, and the more variety you've got of them, the more likely you're going to improve tracking as well. Okay, if everything was a, a bunch of X's and in a row, <laughs> okay, that's easily recognizable. But as it, if the image moves up or down a little bit, it looks just the same and it's not easy trackable. So if you've got other kinds of lines crossing, like the T shapes and the V shapes as well, and there's a, they're, they're distributed in a varied way, then you're going to get a good recognizable target, and you're going to get uh, something that's easily trackable as well. Okay? So if you wanted to create one artificially, that's what you do. And that image that you just saw before, where I went to the AR target generator, that's a perfect example of that. It's full of those kinds of things. All right? So... Um, if you want to, go to the AR target generator and see the kind of things that would lead to a um, highly augmentable image. All right. In this case, there are a lot of key features. Why? What, what things make it have that number of features? Sharp points, yes. Anything else? Good high contrast between foreground and background. Any last... Somebody else? Something else? Yeah, the randomness, the distribution as well. Okay, they're not all clustered in any one area. They're kind of more or less evenly spread everywhere. Yeah, so that's actually a highly augmentable uh, target, both in terms of recognition and trackability. All right. Um, this is something I had to do with the Leonardo project. I thought I could just keep. Um, I thought just increasing the contrast would be enough. Uh, to get more points and increase the star rating. But it turns out that um, beyond a certain amount of shift in contrast, the number of extra points that you get, or identifiable points, flattens out. There's no point in doing any extra increase in contrast or exposure or all those kinds of things. So um, in this example, you can see that the number of points is slowly increasing, but at the end, it doesn't look any different from you know, the point before. <coughs> So you should know when to quit, <laughs> all right? And you've done as much as you can with that particular kind of form of editing. So although the contrast here has been changed, um, there could be other things that you could alter that would make it even more, ident yeah, more useful, although it's got plenty as it is. Does, it, does anybody notice anything about those images, those last ones, where all the points are? Where are they not? Many um, AR... Uh, tools, toolkits, they tend not to process anything within a certain margin of the boundary. 
Okay, there's an exclusion zone, if you will. Not all of them do it, but some do. And it means that it just, it's not even going to look for features with, near that edge. All right? So if that's the case, then do you really need the image to go all the way out to the edge? Actually, it, it makes more sense um, to bring it in a little bit, have a bit of white space between the actual target and the boundary around the edge. That makes it actually distinctly more uh, recognizable and trackable. And it's less processing time because it's not processing all that white space. Yeah? I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. There's a bit later on where I talk about that. Um, if there's one factor, though, it turns out that is responsible for making something really augmentable, it turns out it's to do with the spread of grayscale across the image. Okay? And you can see if the grayscale is all peaked at one end, in this case it's low contrast, or it's at this end, it's, it's slightly a bit more distributed, humpy, it's not flat, if you like, um, they tend not to be good augmentable images because it's obvious from a point of view that you'll see there's very little contrast between foreground and background for a start, even though that one's got uh, a lot more sharpness to it and points. They turn out to be both not very good. And at the other end, you see there's a wide variation of um, uh, grey from one side to the other, but the overall spectrum is pretty flat. The actual amount of greyness, if you like, or the variation in greyness is very little. It's, it's quite flat. Um, something in between, kind of Goldilocks zone, if you like, is something that's flat but a little bit bumpy and is kind of uh, prickly and noisy <laughs> with all the little bumps that you see on here. Okay? Something like that is actually ideal. All right? So something that's kind of flat but got a few humps and is a bit noisy. So if you stick this into uh, Photoshop and you uh, check out the um, spectrum on the grayscale, and you, you should be able to ideally see something like that in a good target. Uh, the one at the end would be terrible because of the amount of graduation there is in it. Even though it's got a flat uh, grayscale spectrum, it turns out it's too flat and there's not enough bumpiness on it. There needs to be bumpiness on a small scale and there needs to be some bumpiness on the large scale but not in between. All right? These are in between, and they wouldn't work. So it needs that combination of those uh, two sides in order for it to be really good. All right. Um, I did mention to you about um, the points being properly distributed throughout the image. In this case, you can see that a lot of the points are clustered towards the bottom left corner, and there's not many points elsewhere. Um, so there's a bias towards being recognizing that. If, if the view of the camera first fell on the top right or the bottom, or bottom right, it wouldn't recognize the image. It would have trouble tracking it as well. All right? So what do you do? In that situation, um, you might as well just crop the image and just work with uh, that area on the bottom left and just work with an image and make that the target, that cropped up area. Okay? And in this case, you can see, by cropping it and then uh, processing it, the points are evenly distributed in the way that we would like them to be across the whole image. And it's not symmetrical either. So sometimes you have to crop down to the area where uh, the most augmentability is. Right? And that's what you use. Now, the thing is, the actual image that is printed might be the one that you see on the top. All right? But the target you use is this one. So it will recognize this bit of the image straight away. Okay, that's what it's looking for. All right? So you can still keep the original image for aesthetic purposes, but for technical reasons and uh, augmentability and trackability, you might only want to use a target that corresponds to the bottom left area. Okay? So that's not intuitive, but you can probably see why you might want to have a target printed image which is different from the actual target you're using for recognition. All right, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> You've already kind of come across it a few times before. It's curved. curved. What's the word that we used earlier for it? Describe this kind of thing. It's smooth, it's soft, it's organic. There's too many organic, soft, natural aspects. In this case, there's only two or three recognizable identifiers. Yeah? All right, so things that are natural tend not to be good. 
in this sense. Now, if you look at a tree, that's different. That's natural, but it's got lots of pointy bits and other things which allow it to be generating all sorts of uniquely identifiable features, especially against the background. If the background is another, the rest of the forest, it's not so easy. But if the background is the sky, that makes it a very good target because there's a high contrast between background and foreground. This is an example I was talking about, this challenge between trackability and recognition. This has got lots of uniquely identifiable, uh, recognizable uh, points. So this is really uh, quick to be recognized and ident identified. Okay, and the, the model will appear on top straight away as soon as it's recognized. Unfortunately, if I took this middle section, and that's what I was focused on, and I moved the whole thing up or down or left or right, as far as the camera's concerned, it's not really seeing anything different. And it wouldn't detect that shift. So although it recognized it, it wouldn't be able to track it. It wouldn't be able to synchronize. So repeating patterns tend not to be a good thing when it comes to trackability. Uh, especially, um, and you also find that with this, that although it got all those unique features, if it was rotated or it was translated, it would look more or less the same. So um, it's a bit of, bit of a paradox, but that's what you get. The number of features, remember, isn't what's important. The number of right features. It's, it's OK to have um, a certain number of points. You find that before it will only uh, generate a certain maximum anyway uh, for the process of optimizing tracking and uh, recognition and for processing purposes. But ideally, as far as we're concerned, we want to see as many as possible. Okay? Uh, but what we don't want to see is a repeating pattern that under translation and rotation would look more or less the same. We know that's not going to work for trackability. Okay, so this is the same thing again. And on the right, you can see um, a kind of alternative. <laughs> there's very few organic shapes. All right? um, there's lots of lines crossing. There's lots of variation in contrast as well. And you'll probably find that the average number of variations across the whole image will take that flat kind of profile that we saw in the spectrum earlier, even though this is in color. Typically, most tools will convert images into grayscale to, to um, assess their ability to be augmented and to be trackable. All right? um, so that's what's going on behind the scenes. It typically, it will be turned into grayscale for the purpose of processing. All right? And I can see that that's got a good variation of color that prob uh, probably would um, give that flat spectrum, but with some variation. That's what we want. All right? OK, this is the point I mentioned earlier, that some tools, um, they deliberately exclude the margin, typically anything between 10 and 20%, it can be, of the width of the actual target. Um, so it makes sense that if that's the case, that you should um, just expand the canvas, if you like, and just have white space there. Um, but also have a clear boundary. Don't leave it, it's just white space, all right, all the way to the edge have a clear uh, high contrast boundary uh, at the edge. And that way, um, it'll know where the edges are, and it won't process anything in the white space unnecessarily. All right? So that can easily be done by shrinking the target and just adding the square around the outside. Or in Photoshop and others, you can just actually ask it to expand the canvas size and fill the new space with white, for example, that, as a color. All right, um, I'm going to do another practical in a moment. Um, I'm just conscious, though, that the things I want to finish off with in a few moments, I want to also look at um, 3D objects as well. All right? But there are some other things that you need to take into account. Targets, typically, when they're looked at through cameras, um, the camera doesn't know that something's transparent. Okay. And if it sees reflections or glossiness or things like that you might see on glass, it looks at those things as features, all right, rather than actually being um, uh, an artifact of some kind. All right? So if you're going to create a target, it's really important, especially when you're creating the image, not to have any transparency in it. There's no point in it. Just have white as the background. All right? So the, the transparency is just going to be discarded. The, the software is just not going to refer to it at all. Especially when it comes to implementation, don't print something on a, something that's transparent, like OHP, 
slide or something like that. Okay? Um, you want something that's opaque and you can't see through. Um, so bear that in mind. Make sure that there aren't any transparencies, any alpha in your image. And make sure that even when you print it out, that you're printing it out on something that isn't transparent and see-through or glass or something like that. Yeah? Yeah. Anything, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment, but you'll find that when it comes to the 3D object section, it's, it's, it's amazing how there are a lot of similarities, that you should avoid glossiness, shininess, anything that's got a lot of reflection, because as I said, the software will interpret these things as not as artifacts, but as actual features. Of what, as far as it's concerned, it's <laughs> it appears on the image, or will think it's something that needs to be interpreted. Right? And uh, if it obliterates some of the actual identifiable features, it can reduce the likelihood of it being recognized or, or being able to be tracked. Okay, um, if you're going to use a target that's on a 3D uh, object, like a, a bottle, for example, or on a door, um, don't make the door the target. <laughs> don't make the bottle the target. Okay, Take the thing that's recognizable and that's not transparent and use that as the target. And ideally, you want a flat version of it. You don't want it to be distorted by the shape of the bottle, for example. All right? You want it to be a flat scanned. Um, and again, with the door, you want to remove the transparency and have a, a solid color in the background. Um, since the color in this case for the actual target is white, then it obviously makes sense that the background should be white, um, uh, black. Okay? The, the one above is the opposite. It's got a dark foreground, a colored foreground, so the background should be white. High contrast between background and foreground. Um, it's important that you remove as many reflections as possible, otherwise the tracking is going to be disturbed. The other thing to bear in mind is that at different times of day, these things are going to look different because of the way that light is refracted and reflected. Okay, and it'll change when the lights are turned on and off as well, and when people walk past and cast shadows over it. So there's all these light effects can cause problems. So ideally, you don't you want to exclude those kind of effects from what you're doing. All right, you're going to get some images which don't have enough identifiable or augmentable points on them. Uh, so this is a very good image. It's high contrast, um, and it's got clear edges, and it's not symmetric, and it's not organic, all those kind of things. So what do you do? In these, in these instances, you supplement it with something that is augmentable, and it's got a lot of features. So typically things that are to do with leaves or... Uh, dried earth, those kinds of things, organic uh, lines and high contrast variations like you see in that flat gray soil spectrum in the background. Um, that's been used as the background. Again, there's two things here. There's high contrast between the foreground and the background, and there's that spectrum or profile of gray with variation of the kind that's ideal um, in the actual image. And you can see, compared to the previous one, um, there's a good, not just a good spread of identifiable points, but also um, that the distribution of them and the focus of them is uh, better than what we had before in the previous image. All right, so hybridizing targets is something you might have to do. And that Leonardo image you saw earlier, that's what I had to do. I had to take some fiduciary markers and I had to attach them to the outside. And by hybridizing it like that way, um, it became a lot more stable and a lot more trackable. But as I said, aesthetically, it didn't artistically suit what was required. So we had to find other ways of changing it. I'll, I'll tell you a secret about what I ended up doing in the end with that. Was, um, the target was uh, printed on a piece of paper, a card, a thick card, and put into a stand. And we were just having all sorts of trouble getting the HoloLens to recognize it because of the lighting conditions. Um, and the fact that the, the frame, the stand, was metallic and had all these reflections on the outside, which kept you know, uh, making things a bit frustrating when it comes to um, not being seen as features of the actual image. So what I did was I just took a photograph of the stand, as it is in the real world. And um, I, it was done at an angle, so it was slightly distorted in terms of perspective. So I went into Facebook, um, sorry, I went into um, Photoshop, and I did a rectangle, and then I dragged the corners of what I'd taken a photograph of to fit that rectangle. So I undistorted it, in other words. And then when I saved that as an image and put it up, suddenly it was recognizable and trackable really easily. <laughs> so I didn't use the image that was printed onto the final bit of paper. I just took a snapshot of reality. <laughs> and use that as a target. 
and it worked perfectly fine. <laughs> so that was a really important lesson. Sometimes if, if all else fails and your kit and software just isn't able to effectively both recognize and track what you're looking at, cheap. Just take a picture of the thing in the real world, all right, and use that as your target, new target. And you'll be surprised how often that, that fixes the problem and it works. <laughs> okay? Um, this is another factor that became really important. We found that <laughs> tracking or recognizing things was slow and a bit jerky and jittery. And it turned out it was down to two factors. One was the, um, the resolution of the image we were using in terms of DPI, dots per inch, or pixels, you know, per uh, inch or whatever. And the other was the size of the image. Okay? Um, we had a 300 dot per image um, target that we were using that was like this big. But as far as the camera was concerned and its resolution, it was a lot less than the resolution of the actual target. So matching the resolution in terms of pixel height and pixel width and pixel density on your target with the resolution and uh, pixel resolution and uh, dimensions of the camera is really important. I found that when I found out the um, resolution of the HoloLens camera and I knew how many, um, what kind of width it was and height in terms of pixels and how much um, resolution it was using in terms of DPI and things like that, when I matched the image as close as I could to that, suddenly the, the recognition and tracking just went right up. So th there has to be a kind of resonance, if you like, a, a, a coherence between the device that's um, doing the seeing and the target. There must be a match, ideally, in terms of resolutions and in terms of um, the width and dimensions of proportions. Yeah? If you get that, then you'll find that the, the ability for the augmented reality experience to be sustained in a very steady kind of way is going to be massively improved. There's no point in having, for example, um, high resolution, 300 dots per inch um, image printed when it's going to be 10 feet away and um, you're not going to be noticing those little tiny pixels at that distance from your camera. There's just no point. You might as well just have it at 72 dots per inch. All right? However, for small targets that you're going to be looking up real close, um, it's probably better for you to use higher resolution. And you make the appropriate adjustments. For large targets, as I said, low resolution, high compression. A small is the other way around. It's higher resolution, lower compression. Keep the file size small because a lot of these targets are going to be used often over mobile. And if a file has to be downloaded over the cloud, for example, it's going to take time. And if it's uh, 2 meg or less, which is typically what Vuforia works with, then you find it recognizes things quicker and it can track things more easier as well. Right? And as I said earlier, do you really need it to be full color? Maybe you can get away with a, a fiduciary marker, or a, a mono or a grayscale image. In the end, everything's going to be processed through grayscale anyway. You know? So if you just want to focus on the experience and you're not fussed about the, the nature of the target, then just choose the things that are going to get it done quickly and get it done effectively. You'll have less processing to do. Last but not least, when it comes to 2D, t 2D targets, most people use phones in their portrait format. All right? So it's a good idea to have your targets in a portrait format, a portrait orientation. If they're in landscape orientation, it involves the person having to move their phone, hopefully, to the point in the target where the most identifiable features are. And that additional effort often can put people off. They might have to step back in order to see the whole target within the field of view of the camera. So if you're going to um, do something that is uh, going to be a wide format, it's helpful to tell people to focus on a particular part of the image to ensure a quicker recognition. So you might need to give people instructions uh, if you're going to use uh, landscape format uh, type targets. I'm going to just finish um, by um, looking at the ideal features of 3D targets. Okay? Uh, now, 3D targets, there, there's only three kinds. Okay? You're going to have targets which are in the world, they're to do with buildings, forests, uh, stuff that's out there in the physical world, um, on a grand scale, if you like. Actual physical objects that you hold or that you can manipulate and manually uh, connect to, 
And lastly, things that have been artificially generated through a computer and through 3D print, for example. All right? So those are the typical things you're going to probably work with when it comes to uh, 3D targets. Now, in order to have an augmented reality target that's actually a 3D object of some kind, you have to work with it by, first of all, converting it into um, a 3D format file, 3D file format of some kind. And the way that you're going to do that, typically, is through some CAD software. Maybe use uh, photogrammetry, where you take lots of photos of an area, and then some software can actually join uh, the images together into a 3D model. Or you use something like an actual 3D scan, um, a handheld device which sends out uh, depth sensing, uh, infrared radiation, or other beams uh, to build up a mesh, and then additionally takes photographs and overlays them on top to get a, a full 3D scan. Uh, so those are the typical routes to being able to create a 3D target that you want to use in an augmented reality experience. Very um, briefly, I just want to mention what they really have to have in terms of I ideal features. Again, it's really important that they're not symmetric. For example, if I hold a ball and it's got no other features on it, um, as far as the camera is concerned, it's looking at a circle. It doesn't know that it's got lots of different aspects to it uh, on other sides. It mustn't be transparent. Again, cameras will just look through it and see the features on the other side and uh, not recognize the object itself. Uh, the glossiness has to be minimized. Ideally, you, uh, it needs to be matte. If it's something you have to get a 3D scan of and it is transparent, sometimes what some people do is uh, put powder on it of some kind. It could be something as simple as talc. Or what they do is spray it uh, with something that's easily able to be removed. And then they do the scan, and then they use um, photos to overlay on top. But photogrammetry kind of does that anyway. So if that's the case, it might be better to use photogrammetry. But even then, photogrammetry has problems with transparent objects. Um, so transparent objects are usually a, a hard thing to uh, scan. The only way you can usually do that is by covering them with something uh, in order for the, the beams not to just go straight through the actual object. Um, it's got to appear different um, as you shift your perspective to it. If it's massive and you move here a little bit and move there and it still looks the same, then that's not going to be easily be able to be worked with. All right? um, having shadows is the equivalent of having edges. If the shadows are sharp, then it indicates uh, edges that can be tracked. It's got to be solid, uh, rigid, and static. If it bends or it moves with the wind and things like that, then the shape that's expected is not going to appear to the software, and it won't recognize it. Um, you can have distinct areas uh, which have got um, variations in color, but very um, clear, bounded colors, as opposed to graduated colors. Um, and there's got to be a tight box around the actual object that you're going to be bringing in. Again, you don't want lots of white space, empty space around the object, okay? Because it'll be trying to look for things that um, in spaces where there aren't any features. The origin's important because if you want to rotate the object or you want to do other things, you want to ideally rotate around a given point. It might look funny if you're rotating it from the edge as opposed to the center, for example. All right, so. When you save your file, make sure that the origin is in the right place. Or you might physically move the um, 3D object until it's at uh, the origin, or change the coordinates physically by typing in 000, for example. Uh, last but not least, as I mentioned just before, um, in terms of the surface features, you want minimum um, uh, gradients. Um, actually, sorry, that should be maximum. I don't know why it says minimal. Um, I think what I meant is that there shouldn't be gradients um, across uh, the actual thing in terms of going, say, from uh, gray to uh, dark to white. There should be hard, um, sharp features that you actually need. And the, the example of the fire engine at the top is a perfect example of something that's got all of those things. All right? Toys, oddly enough, a lot of them tend to have these kind of features. All right? So um, if you follow the kind of thematic uh, style and design that you see of a lot of toys, you've probably got a good chance of having a 3D augmentable target. <laughs>
that one, the, the Mars lander, is one of the models that comes with uh, Vuforia. Um, and you can uh, use that if you can, I think you can 3D print that, and then if you have it in the world, the camera can overlay its idea of it on top, and then it can activate the 3D image. Let me just summarize, though, before I uh, go and do that practical bit. These are the things that you probably need to walk away with in terms of your design and selection and implementation of your targets. They've got to be easily recognized and tracked. <laughs> Take out the size. Uh, you want them to be, uh, the distance that you want them to be seen and recognize that. They've got to have enough of the right features distributed across the viewing area. And from the different angles and orientations that you may encounter it, there's got to be very distinct and unique views of what you're looking at. And if it's not easily augmentable, as I said, combine it with something else to make a hybrid target. This applies to 3D objects as, as well as 2D objects. Okay, so these are the kind of precy of the rules, if you like. Um,